Greetings, everyone, wherever you are in this world. Laszlo Montgomery here again, coming to you via the China History Podcast. About a month after I started this China History Podcast thing, I started getting a lot of comments to produce the show sort of history of Rome like, you know, starting at the beginning and going in chronological order, emperor by emperor, all the way to the last dynasty. I saw a couple reviews and whatnot on iTunes and a few podcast directories that had mentioned this dang podcast doesn't go in any particular order. So we serve the people like we should have, we Ren mean fool, and over the past eight months we have soared high above the treetops and got an overview of Chinese history dynasty by dynasty. We began with the legendary Xia dynasty, for which there are no records showing it ever existed, but we're taking Sima Qian's word for it when he mentioned in detail the tales of the Xia in the records of the grand historian, the Shi Qi. Last week, after wending and winding our way through 42 centuries of history, we finished off, in seven parts I might add, at the last of China's imperial dynasties, the Qing dynasty. It all ended in 1912 the year the Titanic hit the iceberg, and Fenway Park opened, and the Meiji Emperor of Japan died, and Kim Il-sung was born. It was a long journey that took us from sometime around 2100 BC or thereabouts, nobody seems to agree much on when the Xia Dynasty began. 2100 BC was a long time ago. That's 4100 years ago. Well, before the Xia were all these Neolithic cultures going on, and we haven't looked at any of them yet. The Xia came 450 years after the Great Pyramid was constructed in Egypt, so it's pretty old by any accounts. Now, not including Peking Man, who was stomping around China 400,000 years ago, the earliest we go back in China is Pangtoshan culture, which is roughly 7500 BC. These are all Neolithic cultures, which is a fancy way of saying the New Stone Age. This is where humans start figuring out technology and how to do stuff. Thanks to pottery and clay figurines, we've been able to get a feel for these civilizations that sprouted in China. There were over 20 of these cultures, or Wenhua, as they're also called. The more well-known of these cultures were the Hemudu, Yangshuo, Longshan, Arlitu, and there were also others. These are the most well-known. To me, these periods are more about archaeology and anthropology than history, so they're not slotted to become episodes of this podcast anytime soon. I have about 180 topics queued up now, and these Neolithic cultures of China are not among them. Before we arrived at the Xia dynasty, we touched on the San Huang Wu Di, the mythical three sovereigns and five emperors who, legend has it, ruled from 2852 BC to 2205 BC. The three sovereigns, Fu Xi, Shen Nong, and the Yellow Emperor, Huang Di. The five emperors, Shao Hao, Zhuan Xu, Gao Xin, Yao, and Shun. And then to light the fuse and sort of get the whole thing started, uh, Shun, the last of the legendary five emperors, rewards Yu for succeeding where his father Gun had failed in taming the perpetual flooding of China's sorrow, the Yellow River for bringing a solution on how to control the incessant flooding of this river where China's civilization began, Yu avenges his father's disgrace and is made the heir to Shun. And when Shun dies, Yu becomes the first emperor of the Xia. And the Xia lasts until King Tang throws out the wicked King Jie and founds the Shang Dynasty. And when King Jie goes down in 1675 B.C., He becomes the first of many rulers whose infamy as the dynasty's final king or emperor is assured to posterity due to treachery, incompetence, or tyranny. This is all Bronze Age China, the Xia and Shang. During the 11 and a half centuries of this time period in China, the world was thriving elsewhere. This earliest period of recorded history in China was preceded by the great flood of biblical times, of Noah, of all the... Old Testament forefathers, from Abraham to Moses. This was all concurrent with this early period in China. It was a time of ancient civilization, some much older than China. Egyptian, Minoan, Mesopotamian. Developing alongside this Xia Shang era in China were the civilizations in the upper Indus Valley at Mahenjadaro and Harappa. 
The most golden of ages for ancient Egypt ran concurrent with the Xia and Shang. Carthage was founded. Hammurabi lived. It was the time of the Hittites and all these Minoan and Mycenaean cultures that started growing around the Aegean Sea. You'll recall from the Shang Dynasty podcast that it was at this time that the first Chinese characters are seen, carved into tortoise shells and bones of other animals. Here is where recorded Chinese history begins. The center of the Shang was mostly in Henan, around the vicinity of Anyang and Luoyang. There's a lot of blanks, as you could well imagine, and many have simply resigned themselves to go with Sima Qian's version as he wrote them in his Records of the Grand Historian, which covered everything from the Yellow Emperor up to his time in the Western Han Dynasty. When the Shang of the Bronze Age transitions to the Zhou of the Iron Age in 1046 BC, you'll have two and three-quarter centuries of Chinese culture, essentially, blasting off until the Zhou Dynasty sort of fragments, and as we saw in the podcast covering the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, Chinese history went through two phases, called the Spring and Autumn Period, followed by the Warring States Period, the Chunqiu and the Zhangguo Shidai. China starts to take the shape of what we've all become familiar with around this time. As the Shang comes to a close and the Zhou was beginning, this was the time of the Queen of Sheba, Nebuchadnezzar, Kings David and Solomon. As the Western Zhou came to a close, Alexander the Great had already wept that there were no more worlds left to conquer. Cyrus the Great, 5th century classical Greek civilization, had already bestowed its gifts to the Western world. The Etruscans were thriving in Italy. The capital of China moves west from Henan to Shanxi and Xi'an for the first time. Xi'an, called Haojing back then, was the first capital of the Zhou until it moved to the east back to Henan in Luoyang. Great historic Chinese heroes from this period, when feudalism thrived and developed continuously, included Zhou Gong, who gave us the Book of Rights and who served as the model regent to the sovereign. Kings Wen and Wu of Zhou, Guangzhong, Lao Tzu, Confucius, and all his disciples, they all lived during this time. And we all know, after 28 podcasts, how significant was the role Confucian thought was in China. By 475 BC, the spring and autumn period runs into the Warring States period, where the seven states of Qin, Chu, Qi, Yan, Han, Wei, and Zhao all contend for supremacy. This was a period of legendary tales of Bravery, treachery, battle, and feudalism at its best. But in 221 BC, the last of the warring states standing is the state of Qin, with their mighty king, Ying Zheng, who becomes the first emperor of China, who, after the Battle of Changping, succeeded in uniting everything that had broken apart since the disintegration of the Zhou dynasty in 771 BC. So Qin Shi Huang, in addition to burning books, burying scholars, instituting a brutal and strict government to rule over society, building the Great Wall, laying the foundation for Chinese imperial rule and administration, he also gave us the word China, which came from his Qin dynasty. Elsewhere in the world by this time, the Ptolemies were ruling in Egypt. West of China during this time was the Seleucid Empire, and to the southwest, Ashoka the Great reigned. Now, the Qin Shi Huang podcast, you got to hear not once, but twice, so you'll no doubt recall he didn't last long, and in 206 BC, we see the Chu Han contention, the Chu Han Xiangzheng. Here, the two greatest heroes of their time, Xiang Yu and Liu Bang, face off as the two power centers that evolved after the Qin dynasty, like so many dynasties to follow, split up and was followed by an interregnum of battling contenders for ultimate power. But Liu Bang prevails and ushers in the great Han Dynasty, reigning in Chang'an as Han Gaozu. The period of the Han Dynasty is where the world shifts into another gear. It's the time of ancient Rome and Julius Caesar. Roman aristocrats, no doubt all the greatest of the greats, adorn themselves with silks from China. Though these two great empires never came together, except through the traders who plied the Silk Road, this love in Rome of silks from China linked the two cultures, sharing the glory with Han Gaozu and his grandson, Han Wendi, as another powerful force of nature who left his impact on Chinese culture, is Han Wu Di. If not for this Emperor Wu, it's possible the People's Republic of China might be a much smaller entity than it is today. 
Han Wu Di pushed the borders of China far into the west and southwest and created the first real empire of imperial China. Besides these great leaders, the Han Dynasty gave us Zhang Qian, the great explorer. This was also when Sima Qian walked the earth. This time in Chinese history produced plenty of villains as well. Chief among them, who 2200 years after her death is still hung up as an object of scorn, was Empress Liu. Empress Liu, of course, infamous for her acts of vengeance, retribution, and connivance. But as we all recall from the Han Dynasty Part 1 podcast, during the Liu clan disturbance, the dynasty takes revenge on her whole family. Like the dynasties before and for everyone to follow, the Han Dynasty had its day, but fell to ruin in 220 AD. Rome had already started its decline, having just survived the reigns of Commodus and a brief revival under Septimius Severus. Western Han and Eastern Han is bisected in the middle with an interregnum period known as the Xin Dynasty when the great usurper, Wang Mang, insinuated himself in power and held it for as long as he could, which was about 14 years. But the forces of the Xin are defeated at the Battle of Kunyang, and then Liu Xiu brings back the Han Dynasty and reigns as Emperor Guangwu in Luoyang. But things fall apart, and soon the Eastern Han starts to crack into smaller pieces. The red eyebrows and yellow turbans play their role in proving the Han had lost heaven's mandate. It all came down to three warring states and three great larger-than-life heroes, Cao Cao of the state of Wei, Liu Bei of the Shu state, and the Wu state of Sun Quan. And in 208-209 AD, you have the Battle of Red Cliffs, and the allied armies of Shu Han and Sun Wu defeat the numerically superior forces of Cao Wei. This ushers in the Three Kingdoms period, immortalized in Liu Guanzhong's great epic Romance of the Three Kingdoms, San Guo Yan Yi. The clans of Cao, Sun, and Liu contend for supremacy. From this period emerged Zhuge Liang of Shu Han. But in the end, it's a general from the Cao Wei army, Sima Yan, who seizes control of the Cao Wei and then goes on to defeat the Shu Han first, and upon vanquishing the Sun Wu, he unites China under his own dynasty, the Jin dynasty, and Sima Yan reigns as Jin Wu Di and lived it up big time in the palace with his 10,000 concubines from 266 to 290. The Jin dynasty was not fated to be a long dynasty, lasting little more than 50 years. It dies quickly. Then one long period of disunity sets in, starting with the Eastern Jin in 318. Rome had just been invaded by the Goths around this time, and Diocletian had just reigned. The Eastern Jin degrades into the period of the 16 kingdoms and 6 dynasties, from 317 to 420. Although this period is often considered a dark age for China, it's during this period in the 4th and 5th centuries AD that Buddhism blasts off in China and starts to weave itself into the fabric of Chinese culture. Mass migrations of Han Chinese from the north to the south of China began around this time. Then in 420, the Liu Yu, who ultimately brought down the Eastern Jin, he founds the Liu Song, or Southern Song, that lasts until 479. This era was also known as the Former Song, to differentiate it from the Southern Song that was to follow in the 12th century. This period of disunity, when there was no one single China, was known as the period of the southern and northern dynasties, the Nanbei Chao. The Liu Song was simply one of four southern dynasties reigning consecutively, the other three being the southern Qi, the Liang, and finally the Chen. In the north were dynasties of a different nature. These were not Han Chinese emperors. They were nomadic tribal cultures that lived to the north of China, and from time immemorial, these peoples were a continuous fact of life as Chinese civilization developed. These two worlds intermingled on and off, hot and cold, all the way up to the end of imperial China. And during the southern and northern dynasties period, you had the five dynasties of the northern, eastern, and western Wei, northern Qi, and the northern Zhou. And finally, in the year 581, it's an official in the northern Zhou named Yang Jian who unites China under the Sui dynasty. And going all the way back to 280, 280 AD, after the Warring States period ends and the Western Jin 
uh, kicked in. It's it's all this time from 280 to 581, a good three centuries that China is broken up into all kinds of pieces. And my friends, it wasn't an easy age to live in. This didn't stop Han culture from developing there. But if you had to pick a time to live in China, you'd want to avoid these three centuries. So Sui Wendi ushers in the Sui in 581. And at last in China, there's one ring to rule them all. This was also the time of the classical Mayan period, early Middle Ages in Europe, also referred to as the Dark Ages. This was also the time of the Prophet Muhammad. But the Sui are not long-lasting, and among their contributions to China include the Grand Canal and, of course, unifying China. Beyond this, they had China locked and loaded, so that in 618, when the Sui falls and Li Yuan and his great son, Li Shermin, usher in the Tang Dynasty, China reaches the highest highs in the world at that time. This father-son duo, reigning in Chang'an, first as Tang Gaozu and then as Tang Taizong, two great emperors who were joined later on by Tang Xuanzong in 712, and altogether these three emperors, during their respective regnal periods, brought China to its greatest and most spectacular heights. But as we have seen by now, and we'll see time and again, even the greatest dynasties fall victim to the whims of heaven's mandate. The Tang almost lost the mandate when Taizong's concubine, who later became the concubine of his son, Gaozong, went on to seize power in 684. And this concubine we remember as Wu Zetian, the only empress of China to rule in her own name as emperor of her own dynasty, the Zhou. But she succumbs to the enemy of us all, old age, and in her infirmity, power is seized from her and the Tang rises again, with Xuanzong bringing it to its greatest heights in the early 8th century. And around when Xuanzong reigned, Beowulf was written, and the Umayyad Caliphate ruled from Damascus. Once the Tang dynasty fell to its knees in 907, and only took an aggressive strongman to drive the sword into the once great dynasty and established what became known as the later Liang dynasty. And this later Liang dynasty becomes the first of five dynasties to follow the Tang as China plunges into yet another period of disunity in between dynasties. This period immediately following the Tang is called the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms, the Wu Dai Shi Guo. The five dynasties with the later Liang, later Tang, later Jin, later Han, and later Zhou, then, down in the south, you had ten kingdoms, most prominent being the Wu Yue Kingdom around the region of Shanghai Zhejiang. The culture distinct to the people of this region who spoke the Wu dialect, the third most spoken language in China after Mandarin and Cantonese. Their culture began to evolve right around now. So these ten kingdoms were the Wu, Min, Southern Han, Chu, Northern Han, Jingnan, Former Shu, Later Shu, Southern Tang, Wu Yue, who I mentioned already. But when the Tang formally dies in 907, you have a non-Han Kitan dynasty called the Liao. The Liao dynasty rules up in the lands beyond the Great Wall in Mongolia and Manchuria. This dynasty hangs in there from 907 to 1125. Also concurrent with the Liao, you also hit the Jing dynasty of the Jurchen people, who we will recognize later as the Manchus. And to the west, you had the western Xia, who were the Tangut people. And down in the southwest, you had the kingdom of Dali. So China proper, as we have always known it, was surrounded by powerful dynasties to the northeast, all the way to the northwest, and to the west and southwest. And the last of the five dynasties in the north, the later Zhou, yields up the military strongman Zhao Kuangyin, who goes on to found the northern Song dynasty and reigns from 960 to 976 as Song Taizu. He is followed by his younger brother, who becomes the emperor Song Taizong, and it's Song Taizong who finishes up the task of unifying all these wayward parts of China not controlled by these Liao western Xia in uh, Jin, And once again, the region of China proper itself is unified. And during this time, gunpowder is invented, and this changes warfare forever. And real great leaps forward in agriculture and rice production bring seismic changes to China that will result in an explosion in population. Great cities along the Grand Canal and Yangtze sprung up and developed during this Song period. 
Manufacturing became more specialized in China. The Northern Song was a rocket-powered engine, and after the Tang Dynasty shakeout and the non-stop battles of the five dynasties and ten kingdoms, China is once again the center of the world as far as enlightenment, trade, commerce, innovation, engineering, you name it. And during this time, paper money makes its first entry in the world. In 1127, the northern Song were shooed out of their power base in Kaifeng and raised their standard down in the south in Lin'an, which we all know today as Hangzhou. And from Hangzhou, from 1127 to 1279, we had the southern Song, which lasted until the grandson of Genghis Khan, Kublai, Hu Biliet, came along and put an end to the southern Song. He had already established the Yuan Dynasty in 1271 and ruled as the king of the world, so to speak. The Mongol Empire was at its most powerful, and Kublai Khan's part of the empire was in China. He was a great emperor, and his magnificence is the stuff of legends, left behind by Marco Polo, who served in the great Khan's government. But the Yuan Dynasty was not fated for a long run, and once Kublai dies in 1294, the dynasty only has another 74 years until the Mongols have softened up enough to be taken down. So, in 1368, it falls to Zhu Yuanzhang to deliver the death punch to the Yuan, and in so doing, he ushers in the Ming Dynasty, and all Han Chinese rejoice that China is once again ruled by the Chinese. As Yuan turns to Ming, bubonic plague raged in Europe. The papacy had moved to Avignon. The Ottoman Empire was on the rampage. It was the time of the shoguns of Kamakura, Japan. The Ming Dynasty has a great run, and China reaches even greater heights of glory as a country and as a culture. And as sea trade becomes faster and more reliable, the China trade boomed in Ships from ports all over the world sailed to China's great ports to trade in the riches China offered. It was the age of the great eunuch admiral Zheng He and his amazing voyages to Central Asia and the coast of East Africa. But the Ming dynasty fell victim, like every dynasty before, to the fickleness of the mandate of heaven. And in 1644, the final Ming emperor Chongzhen walked solemnly to Coal Hill behind the Forbidden City and hung himself from a tree. And once the rebel rouser Li Zicheng is kicked out of Beijing, the Manchu ancestors of the Jurchens of the Jin Dynasty walked right into the capital and made themselves comfortable for 268 years. So from 1644 to 1912, the Manchus ruled from the Dragon Throne and the Forbidden City. China reached its greatest territorial size, and it is this geography that we see in the Qing Dynasty that we so easily relate to in these modern times. The Qing Dynasty had its ups and downs, but once the 1840s roll around, it's the beginning of the end, and the dynasty died a slow motion and gruesome death from the Opium War to the Wuchang Rebellion. And the Chinese people who lived in these humiliating days, on the one hand, were the Ears to the yellow emperor, Qin Shi Huang, Confucius, and all his disciples of Han Gaozu, Han Wu Di, Cao Cao, Sun Quan, Zhuge Liang, Tang Taizong, and a, and a hundred other great leaders, poets, artists, artisans, military heroes, and everyone else in history who made China so great, even with that great millennia old heritage behind them. The Lao Bai Xing of the late 19th century had to watch their country be carved up and kicked around by Western powers, and then even worse, by the Japanese. Many Chinese look back in anger at these Qing emperors from Daoguang to Puyi, who had the misfortune to play their historic roles in times when the tables were turned, and for the first time since Yu the Great tamed the floods in 2200 B.C., 2100 B.C., China was the weaker nation, and those surrounding the Middle Kingdom were strong. The Qing Dynasty had a good part with emperors Kangxi, Yongzheng, Qianlong, but thanks to characters such as the Empress Dowager Cixi and her conservative allies, China has kept at a standstill while the other great nations of the world advanced. But in 1912, it's over for the Qing, and just like when the Eastern Han, the Eastern Jin, and the Tang before, a violent period of disunity followed. This time in the 20th century, China didn't break down into smaller kingdoms, but there was plenty of warlordism followed by civil war. 
And what we see today is nothing more than the present stage of China's development. And these are historic times in China. Since Yu the Great in 21, 2200 BC, China's been up and China's been down. China in 2011 is a far cry from the China in 1895 when Li Hongzhang had to do the unthinkable and ink his name to the Treaty of Shimonoseki. And you could rest assured that in the weeks and months, and who knows, perhaps even the years to follow, we'll keep diving in and out all over the place to look at all these interesting times from Zhongguo Lishi, Chinese history. And here at the China History Podcast, we're going to do everything we can to create better understanding of China in the 21st century by studying China's history over the past 40 centuries. So here you have it, a nice little 25-minute 20, uh, encapsulated version of everything we reviewed since September last year. Now, I haven't sent out one single tweet yet, but y'all can follow me on Twitter now at Laszlo CHP. That's Laszlo, L-A-S-Z-L-O-C-H-P. I'm going to use this channel to let everyone know when a new episode is uploaded and for general news or announcements concerning this China History Podcast. Starting this weekend, I'm going to be on the run a lot. I have two trips to New York City coming up, going to have all my peoples in town from the great city of Yong, a.k.a. Ningbo. I mentioned the Hemadu culture, one of the Neolithic periods of China. This all went on in and around the city of Ningbo, making it one of the oldest inhabited areas in China, going back to 4800 B.C., so I'm going to be a little tied up for the remainder of this month, but that doesn't mean I can't punch out another episode. So that's it, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from lovely Claremont, California. Yes, home of the world-famous Claremont School of Theology and the renowned China Center of the Center for Process Studies and the Institute for Postmodern Development for China. I hope you'll join us next time, probably from my perch high above Manhattan, as we discuss more history and hang out a little. We'll resume the normal history podcast after I get these trade shows behind me. Take care, everyone.